Hello, everyone, and welcome to the wonderful world of animation and our inaugural series of talking with people in the world of animation. And tonight, we're very proud to have with us as a very special guest, Mr. Dave Bozert. Hi, Neil. Hello. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming uh, on our inaugural show, Dave. Um, we have a lot of stuff to cover. I was thinking about it. You know, we could just do a whole hour on how one goes from growing up in Astoria to ending up on his first job at Walt Disney Studios. We could spend the episode just talking about the movies you've worked on, the books you've written. So I'm sure this won't be the only time that uh, we have you on as a special guest. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I look forward to coming back. Thank you. See, that's it. We're done for the night. You okay. Can... Thanks. Bye, everybody. No. <laughs> but you know, that's a great place to start. You and I are both uh, fellow New Yorkers and you grew up in Astoria. Tell us a little bit about that, you know, childhood into your fascination with animation. And well, you get... I, yeah, you know, I, I didn't actually grow up in Astoria. I was born in Astoria and I lived there for probably about a year before my parents moved out onto Long Island. Uh, but uh, my parents actually met at the old Army Pictorial Center, which was the original Paramount Studios from the turn of the century, uh, wow. be be before they, they uh, moved everything out to Los Angeles. So uh, most people nowadays will know that studio complex, I think it's called the Kaufman Studios in right. Queens. Uh, and, uh, but my, over the, uh, Queensboro bridge. Yeah. And, and my parents actually met one another working at that, uh, studio. And at the time it was called the army pictorial center. And it's where, uh, uh, the army made training films. And my dad, uh, was, uh, in college at Fordham university in the Bronx. And he was part of the ROTC uh, program with the army. And so he, uh, uh, he was doing his duty essentially at the army pictorial center. And my mother was a civilian worker for the army, uh, at the time. And, uh, and that's where they met. So, uh, it, it was kind of interesting that even before I was born, my parents were involved in a movie studio. That's crazy. What a coincidence. <laughs> when did you first fall in love with animation and well you know something I, I think some of my earliest memories are watching some of the local uh television stations in new york there was wpix uh wnet um uh there was uh you know channel five channel nine channel 11 uh and i remember they used to have uh afternoon cartoon shows uh, there was one that was hosted by a guy named Officer Joe Bolton. Oh, and, I remember, you know, Officer remember Joe. Yeah, remember Officer Joe? And, you know, he came, he came out at the beginning of the show in a police uniform. It was like a vintage police uniform, you know, du double-breasted jacket. Uh, and he was twirling his nightstick, you know. And, uh, and he, he would show, you know, uh, Popeye cartoons and, uh, uh, uh you know, some of the Fleischer uh, material and uh, Warner Brothers. And, you know, I, I, I grew up like a lot of people did uh, on the Saturday morning uh, Hanna-Barbera shows that were on the networks, uh, you know, CBS, NBC, ABC. Uh, you know, you got to remember back then when I was growing up, there were, you know, you, you, you had the three networks and then you had a couple of local channels, you know. So right, you, I always you, tell you, people. Yeah. Like yourself, we're of the same generation. It was we didn't have cable, we didn't have VCRs and DVDs, and we uh, pulled our chairs up to maybe a twenty-inch TV if you were yeah. lucky, and yeah. spent you know got up at six o'clock on a day you didn't have to go to school to spend five hours Saturday morning watching your favorite cartoons. Yeah, so you know, I I mean, I I I think like. Like most kids, I had a steady diet of cartoons uh, uh, when I was uh, young, uh, not only on Saturday mornings, but after school, you know, in the afternoons uh, on those local channels. And uh, and then, you know, I remember going to the theaters to see the re-releases of the Disney classics, you know, Pinocchio and Snow White and those films. Um I saw them in movie theaters, but they were on re-release. 
And, right. and so, you know, I, I loved animation early on, but I also just love being an artist. And, 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 you know, my initial goal out of high school was I was going to go into advertising. My father was involved in advertising in Manhattan and I was going to go into advertising and, and actually went to college in New York uh, for uh, advertising art. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, heard about Cal Arts and, and that they were training for the next generation of animators. And so I sent my portfolio out to Cal Arts and, and I wound up getting accepted. You know, it's funny, I, I found out about Cal Arts because somebody I knew gave me an article that was in the New York Times about Cal Arts. That's how mm -hmm. I found out about the school. And, uh, and it turned out that, I don't know, it must have been 20 something years later, I was being interviewed for the book on the making of Fantasia 2000. And I, I remember going to a restaurant in Pasadena, it was the Twin Toms restaurant in Pasadena, it was a really good place. And I was sitting at a table with this author, his name was John Culhane. And, and John Culhane was one of the nicest guys. And he asked me, he said, Dave, how did you get, how did you get into animation? And I told him this story about, oh, this person handed me this article from the New York Times and he threw his hands up. He goes, I wrote that article. Oh, and that's amazing. Kind of a, this full circle on that article because the guy that wrote the article is now I'm sitting across the table from and he's interviewing me for a book. And I was like, wow, you know, I mean, talk about a small world or, you know, coincidences or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, John was, was an amazing individual, you know, uh, a very supportive and effusive about animation. Uh, and uh, I just have many fond memories of him. You know, and, that, and that's a great story because that's what we're trying to achieve by having these talks with people like yourself is it's so easy to see the end results, to yeah. see Walt Disney is successful, or Hanna-Barbera, yourself. Um, but there's great stories behind it. You didn't go from A to Z. You know, for myself, people always say, oh, it's so cool you're dealing with animation. How'd you get there? And I joke, get a master's degree in quantitative statistics. You don't <laughs> know where you're going to end up. Yeah. You know, no. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's very true because I often go out to colleges and I talk. And, and I one of the things I tell people is that, you know, don't, don't, you know, at, at their age, you know, you're 18, 19, 20 years old, and you think you want to be something. But think back when you were a little kid and somebody says, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you say, oh, I want to be a policeman. I want to be a fireman. I want to be an astronaut, you know, <laughs> right? How many people actually went on to do those things? Not very many, you know, and you have to, you have to sort of take the opportunities as they're presented to them, uh, as they're presented to you. And, and I kind of felt very fortunate that that person who handed me that article from the New York Times, they, they presented me with an opportunity. And I could have sat there and said, oh, well, that's a nice article and very cool and just continued on my merry way. Or I decided to say, I want to look into this. And I wrote to the school and they wrote back. And I think I got a letter from Jack Hanna, actually, uh, from the animation program. Jack Hanna was one of the big directors at Disney. He directed many of the uh, Donald Duck shorts and uh, the Chippendale cartoons while he was at Disney. And he was a great story guy. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's like that person handed me that article. There, it was like there was a reason for that. And I, I took that and I, I acted on it. You know, I reached out to Cal Arts. Then I sent my portfolio. And then, you know, I, I was blown away. I got accepted. And, um, you know, I, I got a Walt Disney scholarship and I went out to California cold. And, you know, it's kind of scary when you think about it because I didn't know anybody west of the Mississippi mm -hmm. at the time. We had no relatives. We had no friends out in California. I knew one guy uh, who was from my hometown, and I didn't know him very well, but he had moved out to Los Angeles. So it was the only person I could, like, connect with when I got into Los Angeles. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of, um, you know, nerve you know you gotta you gotta really muster some nerve to 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 head out and do something like that by yourself 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, sure. and you know, and, and you know, you never. It's funny when I was at Cal Arts, I was there with a lot of people who were huge Disney fans, and they were all wanting to work at the Disney Studios. And anytime anybody asked me whether I'd work, wanted to work at the studio, I said, "Oh no, I, I'm going to go back to New York and do commercials." You know, that was that was that that was the, the only thing I was sort of focused on, and 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 it was funny because. I just, you know, we'd always say that. And then when I graduated from Cal Arts, I got a job at Don Bluth Studios. And then uh, yeah, I was there for like eight months. And then a friend of mine who was working at Disney said, hey, send your book over to Disney. Uh, they got this thing going on, you know, the Black Cauldron and they need help. And I, so I sent my book there and uh, Don Hahn hired me. Uh, and, uh, and I started working on Black Cauldron and, and I worked as much overtime as possible because I figured at the end of Black Cauldron, I'd get laid off and, and then I'd go back to New York to do commercials, you know, and as mm -hmm. the things went along, I didn't get laid off. I went on to the next picture and then I thought, well, at the end of this picture, I'll head back to New York to do commercials. And I was, I really was sort of in that mindset for like the next five years, you know, and, 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 yeah. and, and as I got these pictures under my belt, I was like, hmm, okay, you know, like five years on, I guess I'm staying here, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I wound up doing a whole bunch of commercials, by the way, but they were all just freelance gigs that I did in Los Angeles. I just want to backtrack a minute because so many people <laughs> hear about Cal Arts you know, they know some anime stuff that went there. I wonder if you could share with our audience a little bit about just what an amazing institution it is and some of the people that have come through there that are now sort of household names to Disney and sure. animation fans in general. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting because, you know, Cal Arts is only 50 years old. In fact, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary uh, at the end of April, but it, it, it's two years late because of the pandemic. <laughs> so it's really the 52nd anniversary, but that's okay. And uh, uh, it was really uh, Walt's vision uh, to put CalArts together. Walt Disney had this vision of creating this interdisciplinary art institute. And... He basically was helping out the Chenard Art Institute. Madame Chenard was, was running, and she had some financial issues. There was an accountant that apparently had embezzled some money, and so she was struggling. And, and then there was the L.A. Uh, Music Conservancy, the L.A. Conservancy. And so Walt was able to take both of those organizations and basically mash them together to create Cal Arts. And, uh, and then... Uh, Shortly after Cal Arts opened, it was like five or six years after Cal Arts opened, they they created the animation, the character animation program there to train the next generation of artists. Because a lot of the old timers who were doing doing animation with Walt at the studio, they were all getting up in age and they were starting to retire, you know. And so they realized they needed to start really training the next that next generation, and. Um, uh, so the program only lets in 30 students a year into the program. Still to this day, and by the way, I will, as a disclaimer, tell you I am on the board of trustees of Cal Arts. So I will speak Cal Arts and, and champion Cal Arts everywhere I go. It's not the only animation program nowadays, but you know that's where I went, and uh, and I and a lot of a lot of great uh, animation artists went there. Uh, you know, people like John Musker, uh, who was one of the directors of Little Mermaid and Aladdin and uh, Hercules and, you know, a bunch of films. Uh, you had people like Tim Burton, uh, you know, of Nightmare Before Christmas fame and all the other movies he's done. Um, you know, Tim is grad, you know, graduated from there. And then you get into people like, you know, Rob Minkoff, who was co-director of The Lion King. 
uh, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Brad Bird, who, who did The Incredibles at Pixar and uh, Iron Giant and uh, Mission Impossible for Paramount. I mean, you know, uh, Andrew Stanton, uh, Pete Doctor. I mean, you know, you just go down the list and it, it's just a who's who of the animation community today. Yeah, it's just amazing how much talent coming from one program. You know, you talked about getting your start on the Black Cauldron. I'm just looking at some notes. You worked on the Great Mouse Detective, um, Little Mermaid. But as people can see in back of me, you worked on my all-time favorite movie, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and got to work in London with the incredible Richard Williams. Yeah. And, and on a film that is so different. Can you share some the experience of working on that and with him. Yeah, you know, um, the the technique at the time, you know, the animation and live action, it, it was a known technique. I mean, you, you saw it in uh, Mary Poppins, you saw it, saw it in Song of the South. Uh, and, you know, even at the time that we were doing Who Framed Roger Rabbit, you, you saw it in commercials uh, on television, you know. Uh, so it was an established technique, but, who Framed Roger Rabbit, the movie, took that technique to the nth degree uh, and really, I mean, made it so that it would, I mean, look, it's more than 25 years since we made that movie and that film still holds up really well. I went to a 25th anniversary screening a couple of years ago and it was, um, you know, I saw it in one of these uh, old movie houses, you know, the big auditorium. And it really held up well, I thought. Uh, and you got to realize we did we did that, com uh, that that movie without any computers. You know, it, it was all analog, so to speak. You know, it was all hand drawn animation, and it was all composited on optical printers. There was no computer compositing or anything like that. I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. I had a great time. In fact, I a lot of times people say, "What's the favorite? What's my most favorite movie that I worked on?" And I can't give you an answer to that because every one of them holds, you know, a vault of of memories. But Who Framed Roger Rabbit kind of bubbles to the surface because of the fact that I was able to work on it and live in London, and that was a great experience for me. You know, it was really a lot of fun. Uh, to, to be in another country and in an English speaking country and working with a, a crew of artists that really was truly international. Uh, we had artists from all over Europe, all over the world, really, uh, that were working on that project. And it was, it just brings back such a flood of memories for me. Uh, and I can remember the first day that I went into Daly's. Uh, we were in a building in Camden Town. It was an old electrical parts uh, factory that had been converted to like office lofts. And and I remember showing up to to the and, and I'm kind of an early bird. I get I, I do a lot of my best work early in the morning. And so I showed up at the studio at like seven o'clock in the morning in London. And, you know, that's like the middle of the night for those folks. <laughs> They're just getting home. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's it, it's like 7 o'clock in the morning, and, and the, the, the front door is locked, you know. And so I just kind of hung out until the studio manager showed up, Max Howard. And, I, and you know, I, I didn't really know him before that. And, you know, we got to know each other. But, like, the next day he came and handed me a set of keys. He goes, you can let yourself in. Uh, from now on you know but you know we were we were working in this electrical parts uh, old electrical parts factory and i remember going into a screening room to see the dailies and i gotta tell you i had i had a smile ear to ear on some of the color dailies because when i walked out of there i thought to myself this is either going to be the greatest animated movie that's ever been done or it's going to be the Heaven's Gate of animation, <laughs> and, and and for for our listeners, Heaven's Gate was like this incredibly expensive movie that was the most horrible bomb uh, at the box office, you know. So I I, I I I'm using it as an example, but maybe I'm dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily it didn't turn out that way, you know. And and you were there through 
you know, this great rebirth, as they say, a renaissance of, of the Disney films, the, the new classics, Aladdin and Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. But your role sort of changed because, as you said, you didn't intend to be an animator, but then you started, you know, you, you also mentioned, you know, you were there with real hand-drawn animation. Yeah. And the industry starts changing to computer and your roles changed on the different projects and the different aspects in the filmmaking um that you yeah took I, yeah I, absolutely i mean you know uh, if you're working in an industry you know you you're hopefully absorbing knowledge and you're you're gaining experience and you're moving up the ladder and and that's really you know i started out uh at the bottom uh as an in-betweener and and then I became an animator and, you know, and, I, and as an in-betweener, I was doing assistant work and all kinds of stuff. But I became an animator and then I became a supervising animator uh, doing effects. And uh, and then uh, I, you know, moved up uh, to uh, a visual effects supervisor, uh, artistic coordinator, uh, then it was creative director, director, producer, executive producer. I was wearing a lot of different hats, uh, depending on what the projects were. Uh, you know, I had the ability to uh, produce and direct a series of safety films with Pumbaa and Timon. Those are still playing uh, on the resort TVs uh, at the parks, uh, in you know, in the hotels. Um, uh, and I'm very proud of those. I got I had a chance to work with the Underwriters Laboratories out of Chicago, uh, and you know those films have been dubbed in 34 languages and shown all over the world. Uh, part of educational curriculum. Uh, there is uh, uh, you know just uh, so all kinds of parks and resorts uh, projects that I worked on, special projection shows converting films that I had worked on originally into IMAX uh, presentations, 3D, all, all kinds of stuff. So to me, it's always exciting because, you know, again, one of the things I say when I go out and speak is that when somebody comes in and says, can you do X, Y, and Z, you should just say yes. <laughs> so you, just say yes. Don't, don't, don't sit there and wring your hands going, oh, I don't know. I've never done that before. Just say yes and then go figure it out. You know, exactly. because that that's what really what most people do, you know, and, uh, you know, I I was always open to doing all kinds of uh, uh, different types of projects and things that had never been done before and working with teams and you figure it out, you know, and you mash together stuff and do quick prototypes uh, and uh, and and you go from there. So uh you know that's uh, that to me is what, what where the fun is and and like Walt, I I don't want to repeat myself. I I always wanted to keep moving forward and trying new things and learning new new things. So, you know, from from hand drawn to digital, I pretty much transitioned fairly easily through that. You know, so whereas other people didn't, other people decided they didn't want to deal with digital. Uh, they didn't want to learn it. Uh, they just wanted to draw. I want to get into some other things before I do to stay in that same era. You were talking a bit about how you didn't know how the reception to who framed Roger Rabbit would be. And you worked on Hercules, which at the time may not have been the best received movie, but now has just created almost like a cult like following. Yeah. What was it like working on that? And what do you think people are seeing now that they might not have seen at the time? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, I think I was already working on uh, uh, Fantasia 2000, but I was on Fantasia 2000 for like five years, right? So the reason why I have a screen credit on Hercules and The Hunchback is because I wound up doing uh, some uh, additional uh, uh, visual effects supervision. So I, I was helping out colleagues to get films finished while we were working on Fantasia 2000. So because we had a deadline that was further out, we could pause and say, okay, we'll take on you know, a certain amount of work from you guys to help you out, you know? Uh, so uh, uh, working on all of these films, uh, you don't know 
how it's going to be received. I mean, you know, a perfect example is The Lion King. There was a lot of people who did not want to work on The Lion King. There was a lot of artists who were trying to leapfrog uh, from Aladdin uh, onto uh, Pocahontas because they perceived Pocahontas was going to be the, the next big hit movie. And Lion King, uh, there's too many, too many problems. They, they had personnel change outs and, and, and they were having story issues and stuff like that. And uh, and now you look back and you go, oh my gosh, you know, Lion King is this juggernaut, you know, of uh, of a film, and uh, you know, uh, Pocahontas didn't do as well as everybody thought it would, right? You know, uh, and, and by the way, it did very well, and it's a beautiful film. And I was not only involved with the original Pocahontas, but I also did the special edition where they uh, added in the sequence, If I Never Knew You, uh, sequence back into the film for, I think it was the 10th anniversary of the movie. Um, I, and I'm trying to think what else. I think I might have been involved with the IMAX conversion of that film too. So, you know, you, you just don't know when you're working on a movie, you know, you're putting 150% of yourself into it like all your colleagues are doing. And you're hoping it will resonate with um, uh, with an audience, you know that it, it was heartbreaking to see a film like Strange World last fall, uh, you know, bomb essentially at the box office. And I watched the movie and I thought this is a beautiful, beautiful film, you know, that you'd want to see on a big screen, right. but it just didn't resonate with audiences. You know, and, you know, from what I'm hearing, it, it, it seems to have gotten a, a sort of a second uh, life uh, on streaming where, you know, the viewership is bumped up a little bit. But, you know, I don't know what, you know, what that is or, or you know, why, uh, unless it's just because it's free on, you know, it's <laughs> quote free on TV. Right. I mean, you have a subscription, a monthly subscription to it, but it's not like people didn't go out to the theaters to see it, which is what you would have expected, you know? Yeah. A problem in general. But, but yeah, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, you don't know, you you just don't know. You you put your heart and soul into these movies and you hope it's going to resonate with the audience. And every so often one of them doesn't, you know, and, and it's heartbreaking because you, I know so many people who work on strange world and they, and they put their heart and soul into the movie and it looks beautiful. You know, the execution was, you know, second to none, but the audiences just didn't come to it. You talked about um, working on Fantasia 2000 for five years, and I definitely want to touch base on that because not only was it an amazing uh, production, brought you to the Academy Awards, but almost, if I can just paraphrase it, maybe the next shift in this never-ending uh career path of yours by opening you up to your Mr. Disney and where that led you to. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I knew, I knew Roy before Fantasia 2000, but I really got to know him very well on Fantasia 2000. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say, I, I don't know. I, I kind of tongue in cheek tell people that Fantasia 2000 was my swan song in animated film production. Because after that, I really wound up starting to do special projects, and I wound up building up a, a special projects unit that I eventually became the head of. Uh, I was the creative director, a head of special projects. I was producing, uh, and wound up for the, uh, I guess really the next decade plus doing some six hundred or so projects for the company, and that that was everything under the sun. I mean, you name it, I probably, you know, if it had animation, we were doing stuff for the cruise lines. We were doing stuff for parks and resorts. We were doing attractions. We were doing audio animatronic work. We were doing games, um, uh, uh, outdoor spectaculars like World of Color and uh, Paris Dreams. Um, 
you know, there was just some, I mean, we, we supplied animation for Dancing with the Stars on ABC when they did their Disney episodes, hmm. you know? So, I mean, it was just, you know, we did stuff for ESPN and I, it was just, the list went on and on and it was everything from, you know, uh, an image to, you know, full on production. Uh, and, and that was exciting because every project that came in was something new and different. You know, the dwarf mine coaster, uh, that's down at Walt Disney world and out in Shanghai. Uh, you know, we, we had our hand in doing the animation of the dwarves faces that are projected inside dimensional animatronic figures in the ride. You know, like, I mean, just mind blowing stuff that when you look at it, you, you just sort of like, wow, you know, this is like when you see it after the fact, it's sort of like craziness, you know, like, you know, it, and it takes it takes so many different people the, that that was the fun part is is working with these incredible teams that were artists and engineers and electricians and lighting people. And, you know, uh, just I mean, every craft under the sun to put these attractions together and and wow the audience and that was always the, the 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 best part of it was to see people you know with their mouths agape oh, oh my gosh you know like looking at stuff and, and, and you know that you had a hand in uh, and all your colleagues had a hand in creating and now that, that was all the fun stuff yeah and 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 not saying it because you're our first guest here on on this new venture they're undertaking but truly, you know, one of the things I always find most interesting and in talking with you and hanging out with you is you really have had a career unlike most anybody else, because as you just said, you've touched in almost every facet and aspect of the company. And, and it might all be centered on the creativity and animation, but from, like you said, Imagineering and hotels and cruise ships and promotional and, and health and instruction, you've, you've done it all. Um, but I gotta, you know, step back a second and say, you work with Roy E. Disney. I know we've shared some great stories. Um, the wonderful book you wrote, Remembering Roy E. Disney, uh, compared to you, I had very little interaction with them, but I did get to spend time with him. I, I took a Panama Canal cruise where we were, uh, had adjoining cabins and, and got to spend time and truly, you know, that old aspect, you say people get to a certain level and not that anybody has the right not to be nice and friendly, but never a more friendly and welcoming person willing to spend time, willing to listen and uh, truly enjoyed discussing his work. And I'd love if you could share some of your remembrances and stories with him. You know, I, you, you summed it up. I mean, he was really one of the most grounded people. Uh, I, you know, I have a friend who, who made a comment once. He said he saw Roy crossing the parking lot, and he looked at me, and he says, he goes, there goes the richest man in the trailer park, you know? <laughs> and, and, and it was sort of like, you know, uh, Roy was one of the guys, you know? And, and, and even though he had that wealth and he had the name, uh, he managed to be a very grounded individual who was very polite. And, and I often tell people that he would talk to you the way he would talk to the president or a head of state in Europe. Um, and he, he, he didn't treat you any differently than he would treat those people. And that says a lot about a person, I think. Um, he was generous to a fault, um, in, in ways that, I don't know, you just, uh, it was always kind of funny, you know, I, I, I remember, uh, talking with him one day and, uh, I had received an invitation, uh, to the opening of Mary Poppins on Broadway. And uh, because I had helped uh, uh, the theatrical group with, with some animation elements that were projected in the show. And so I, I get this invitation to go, 
go to the opening of Mary Poppins. And I asked Roy, I said, hey, Roy, are you going to the opening of Mary Poppins? And he says, yeah. He goes, are you going? I said, yeah, I got invited. He goes, well, if you want, I'll give you a ride there. And what he meant was, uh, you can come on my 737 to New York. Uh, I'll give you a ride. You know, like it was like your buddy saying, hey, I'll bring the station wagon over and pick you up at your house. You know, <laughs> and, and that's that's the way he was. He, he was like, hey, I'll, I'll give you a ride. And then he said, he goes, but you have to find your own way back because uh, we're going on to Europe. And I was like, OK, you know, so I wrote, I, you know, I, I got a, I hitched a ride with him on his 737 to New York. And that was just a lot of fun, um, you know, and I, I remember traveling with him. Uh, and, and this is a story I tell in the book because I uh, uh, we were uh, down at Walt Disney World and we were staying at the Floridian and um when and we were flying commercial, by the way, because uh, some executives from his holding company were were using the plane for business, so we we flew uh, we flew commercial to Florida and then f uh, up to New York, and he really wanted to fly JetBlue, so I, I had to actually go like get a special approval within the company because United was the company's carrier. And so you were supposed to book all your travel on United. And instead, um, I had to get the special permission to book us a flight on JetBlue to go back from New York to, um, to Los Angeles because they'd fly into Burbank. And it was closer to his house, you know. And so, uh, <laughs> so I, I wound up getting that. But we were leaving the Floridian and, you know, there was a bellman. Uh, and, uh, you know, we each gave the bellman a couple buck tip and we fly up to New York and instead of staying at a hotel, Roy had an apartment in New York and he said, Hey, if you want to stay at the apartment, you're welcome. It's got plenty of room. And so I said, sure. So I stayed at his apartment and, you know, had my own bedroom in the apartment, but I, I get into the apartment with him and I go down the hall. He says, yeah, take any one of these rooms. So I throw my bags in one of the bedrooms. And then I come back out and he's standing in the middle of the living room looking at his hands. And I said, what's the matter? He goes, I think I lost some money. I go, what do you mean you lost money? He goes, I had like $300. And he goes, I only have a couple dollars. I said, oh, I said, well, we can hit an ATM. And he looked up at me and he goes, I don't have an ATM card. And I was like, oh, I go, well, I have an ATM card. I can give you some money. He goes, are you sure? I go, yeah, I know where you live, you know. <laughs> so, and he started laughing, and I went to I went to an ATM and I got some cash and gave it to him, and and he, it, it just you could tell it bothered him. He didn't know where this money went, right? So we do our business in New York, and then we wind up flying back to Los Angeles, and turns out when we were checking out of the Floridian. He thought he was giving the bellman a couple dollars. He gave him he gave him like three hundred dollars, and the bellman, who was an older guy, he was probably in his like sixties, like late sixties maybe. He mailed the money back to Roy. Wow! And said, "I think you made a mistake, and I wanted to return this to you." And I, I remember Roy. Uh, was like blown away by that and like wrote the guy a nice handwritten note on one of his buck slips that said Roy Disney, you know, and he signed it Roy and, and he mailed it back to him with a nice tip, you know? Uh, but the funny thing was that I lent Roy the money and it was still bugging him. When we got on the jet blue flight, we were sitting next to each other and you know, it's like the whole plane is coach. So we're in coach. We're sitting next to each other. And he goes, gosh, I just don't know what happened to that money. And I said, well, I go, I bet I, I better have you sign an IOU for me. So I actually have a signed IOU on, on a JetBlue cocktail napkin that, that says I, I – because I gave him like $100. And I counted it out in 20s. I used to put your hand out. He put his hand out with 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. I said, don't spend that all in one place, I told him. And, oh, and he so laughed. And, uh, and, and he made sure that his assistant, Monica, 
uh, she he made sure that she got that hundred dollars back to me. But I, but I have this uh, this little keepsake because he signed it. I wrote out. I said uh, I owe Dave one hundred dollars, and I I said here you go. And he took the pen and he wrote Roy. <laughs> And we had a laugh about it. So, yeah, but, you know, re- really terrific stuff, I have to say. And, uh, you know, the, there's so many stories like that. There's just, you know, when traveling with him and people coming up to him and, and how, just how gracious he was. And by the way, when we were at the parks, we would wait in line for stuff. He didn't expect special treatment. He didn't want to jump the line. He felt that people went to the parks you know, uh, uh, you know, he felt like he shouldn't jump in front of them. They spent a lot of money to get to the to, to the park on a vacation, and he was going to wait his turn. And in fact, we had dinner one night at the top of the Contemporary Resort uh, uh, in Walt Disney World. And when we were uh, done with dinner, we we came down to the uh, monorail platform because we were just going to take the monorail back to the Floridian Hotel. And uh, we got down onto the onto the platform, and we just got online, and we just waited with everyone else, and you know, the I can't monorail. imagine the look on people's faces. No, like, but like the the monorail came in, and a bunch of people got off, and then a bunch of people got on, and then we had to wait for the next monorail because that one was full, and you know, and nobody really like. I, I could tell like one or two people kind of looked like, and they were like, yeah, no, nah, that's you know? not good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why would he be waiting online? You know? And then, and then when we got up to, you know, the entrance and got onto the next monorail, like uh, there was one guy who almost was like having a heart attack. Cause he realized it really was Roy. You know, he's <laughs> like, Oh, Oh my God. Oh, oh you know, like <laughs> it was hilarious. But you know that's uh, that, that's really the way he was. I mean, you know, incredibly gracious, uh, really a nice guy, uh, thoughtful individual. Um, you know, really cared about the people he was working with and the team. You know, and he cared about the company. You know, I mean, he. I, I remember I, we were at Walt Disney World once, and he complained to me. He goes, "Why do they have the name Disney on the side? It's so big on the side of the buses." He goes, "Everybody who's here, they know they're at Disney World." You know. <laughs> and it's my my fond memory of him. As I said, I took this fourteen day Panama Canal cruise. It was tied in with. Uh, the 50th anniversary of Disneyland, the first time they brought the ship to the West Coast. And he was just, nobody knew. He wasn't on as a guest, he, you know, at, uh, as a speaker or anything. He was just taking the cruise, still uh, with Patty at the time. Ended up, like I said, in cabins next to him and uh, met him. Captain introduced us and uh, super gracious and all. Said, let's have dinner together. It was great. It was, you know, for a geek fan like me, night of your life. And you figure that's it. And at the end of the night, you know, make a long story short, he's like, we meeting 5.30 tomorrow and we'll have dinner. And being the New York, I'm like, don't they make you like eat with the captains and stuff? And he was like, I'd like to do that. He goes, this was fun. Let's do it again tomorrow. And yeah. we pretty much had dinner every night of the cruise, just talking like you and I are talking. And for him, it's a normal life. For somebody like me, you're just sitting there like, this is like another planet, like it's just yeah. an out-of-body experience and yeah. just sharing stories and treating you like you said, like you were the most important person in the world. You know, one of the interesting things that I realized about Roy early on was that everybody thought that he was always busy and always doing stuff. And and therefore, they wouldn't ask him if they if you know, they, you know, do you want to join us for dinner or whatever? A lot of times he wound up spending dinner, uh, having room service in his room, watching TV. And so, you know, we were, I was with him on a trip to London once. And, uh, and, you know, this is many years after I worked on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So anytime I go over to London, I, there's always a bunch of people I, you know, will, will reach out to and try and have a dinner with or meet up for a drink or something. And uh, so there was a friend of ours, Christina, uh, who I knew from my Roger Rabbit days. 
And uh, I, so I told her I was coming over to London. I said, let's meet up for, for dinner. And, uh, and so that day came around. And for whatever reason, I was talking to Roy earlier in the day. And I just got this sense that he had no plans. I said, I go, are you doing anything for dinner? And he said, no. I said, I'm just going to meet a friend at this little Greek place that we really love. Uh, and, and I said, well, you want to join us? And he, he just lit up. He goes, yeah, that'd be great. And and, and we, we we took a black cab over to, it, it's a little restaurant called Lamonia up in Primrose Hill in London. And uh, and. We just had the most fantastic time, and and there was another another person with us on the trip who joined us. So there was it wound up being four of us together. But I sent a, I sent an email to my friend Christina, and I said, "Hey, I'm I'm bringing Roy uh, Roy Disney uh, with it, uh, to join us." And and I can't say on this podcast what she <laughs> said back to me, but but. She she thought I was kidding her, but she didn't use that terminology, you know. <laughs> and and you know we wound up, um, you know we wound up having a really great time at this restaurant. Um, you know nobody bothered us, uh, and it was one of those sort of relaxed dinners. People were trying stuff over each other's plates, and you know it was just really, real fun, you know, and 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 relax. And and I think he enjoyed that. But after that particular moment i i always would say to him hey you know you have plans tomorrow what are you doing you know what what, you know another trip i was on to orlando he uh, with him i had to go over to when the cruise ship was in at port canaveral to to do something while it was while it was in port for the day and we were putting a doing a new show or something on board the the ship and I, the day before, I said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? He goes, well, I didn't really have any plans. I said, I have to go out to the cruise ship uh, to do something on a show. Do you want to you want to go out to, to the ship? And I said, he said, sure. Yeah, that sounds great. And I had to rent a car, and I just, you know, the two of us drove out to, to the cruise ship. And I kept telling the show, uh, the, the show director uh, on, on the ship, I, kept, I, I emailed him several times and said, hey, I'm bringing Roy with me. I'm bringing Roy with me, and he he thought I was bringing this other guy named Roy, uh, not Roy Disney. And and we we show up in the theater, and I introduce him. I oh, this is Roy Disney. This is so and so. And you can see the blood drain out of this guy's head. And and he like you know he was real pleasant and everything. And he goes, uh, excuse me for a second. And I guess he went and made a call or something because like. Ten minutes later, the captain came in in his uniform. <laughs> All these people were coming into the theater, and Roy was just sitting up in one of the empty seats while I was down doing what I had to do with the with the team uh, about the show. But it was really fun, funny kind of you know stuff. And, and by the way, that that leads me into that story that you teased a lot of people uh, with. with um, uh, Steve Jobs and and going to the Academy Awards and everything. So you know we were at the Academy Awards because Destino uh, uh, got nominated and and it was Roy and Dominique Montfrier, uh who was the director. The two of them were the nominees for that short, and we didn't win. And you know, we wound up all meeting out in the lobby at the after the Academy Awards ended. We we met in the lobby of the uh, uh, Kodak Theater at the time. Now I think it's the Dolby Theater, and and there was sort of this small group of us standing in a circle. And somebody came over to talk to Roy, and I noticed Steve Jobs walks up, and and he just quietly waited you know, until Roy was done talking to whoever he was talking to. And then he stepped in to say hi to Roy. And, uh, and then, you know, they talked for a bit and then Steve left and Roy said, you know, what do you guys want to do? Cause some of them had tickets to the governor's ball and Nancy and I didn't. Uh, so, you know, we were fine with just taking the car back home and then sending the car for them, you know, but, Everybody was sort of hemming and hawing. Nobody wanted to commit to anything. So Roy finally looks at Patty and says, Patty, what do you want to do? And she says, you know, I'd really like to get an In-N-Out burger. And 
everybody looked at each other and they were like, okay, you know, and we, we went down to where the cars were being brought up and we got into our limo, left the, uh, the uh, theater and uh, we went to an in and out burger on Coanga Boulevard near Universal City. And, and, and the driver tried to go through the drive through which didn't work. There was like a hairpin turn that the limo was not going to make. So a couple of us jumped out. We went in. We got a whole bunch of burgers, a whole bunch of fries, uh, got back in the car, went to Roy and Patty's house, and uh, he popped a, a, a magnum of red wine. And we sat there having burgers and fries and drinking red wine and talking about the evening and telling stories until like one o'clock in the morning, you know, and it was just such a memorable, such a memorable, memorable story. You know, I I mean, you just remember those things so well, you know, And, uh, and and again, you know, just so gracious about it, like. You know, he, it was almost like they just didn't care about the governor's ball. Like they'd rather have an in and out burger than go to the governor's ball. And I, I just thought that was terrific. And, and part of me kind of, kind of thinks that because some of us didn't have the tickets to the governor's ball, that he just wanted everybody to stay together. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That if we weren't there, maybe they would have gone to the governor's ball. I don't know. So, but, you know, just a really, uh, just a wonderful person that I have a lot of fond memories uh, for. You know, when I started this evening, I said we could have so many conversations about so many topics, which sort of jumping around, but there's one that, you know, I feel we absolutely have to talk about tonight and I'm sure we're going to have many other conversations. And that of course is the little guy behind me and the great ears, which is Oswald and yeah. you know, the definitive book, Oswald, the lucky rabbit and spend an incredible amount of time researching it. And, uh, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, what brought you to that subject and share some of what you learned along the way? You know, I have to tell you, like with a lot of things, it just an opportunity presented itself. It really did. You know, I I was a fan of the, the early cartoons of Oswald and just early animation history. And I just happened to see, um, uh, a lost Oswald cartoon, uh, uh, Hungry Hobos, was coming up for auction uh, at an auction, you know, an animation memorabilia auction in Hollywood. And I read a little blurb on it in, uh, online. And the next thing, uh, the next thing you know, uh, my phone rings and it was uh, Ed Catmull who was then president of of Disney Animation. And he said, uh, you know, somebody's inquiring about Oswald, da, 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 da. Could you answer this question? And I said, hey, by the way, there's a lost Oswald cartoon that's just surfaced. Uh, It's in an auction. I think Disney should buy it uh, and repatriate it since, since Bob brought Oswald back so, so he says, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So he arranged to have the, you know, a certain amount of money available to, you know, for me to go and, and buy it at the auction, which is what I did. And, um, and then we had that restored and we put a soundtrack to it. And I thought to myself, well, if this one surfaced, there might be some other lost ones out there. Because when they repatriated those first 26 cartoons back to uh, Disney from Universal, uh, Universal only had like 13 of them. And, and, and I don't know how many people will remember this, but many years ago, it's got to be 20, 25 years ago, there was a massive fire on the back lot of Universal Studios, and they lost a lot of, you know, uh, uh, material, a lot of film material, a lot of masters. And I think some of the Oswald cartoons may have gotten lost there. You know what I mean? So the 13, the 13, so half of the, of the cartoons they had, the other half were, were missing. And, uh, and so I just kind of felt like, gee, you know, there's probably more out there. And, and so I, I asked if we could, you know, uh, uh, allocate some money to look for those. And I, I brought on a guy named David, David Gerstein, who's a friend of mine. And David, uh, uh, really, uh, uh, 
you know, did some digging in archives all over the world and found uh, a bunch of other uh, cartoons that we were able to get scans of, do restorations on, put music to. So it, it just became this, this evolution of, you know, okay, well, we found, we, we bought this one, now we found more, and, you know, you're doing all this research, and it's sort of like, let's, let's put a book together on this, you know, and, and that's really how that all came about, which is kind of the story of my life, you know, because, you, you know, the, the Roy Disney book was, uh, was done at the suggestion of Don Hahn. He was like, oh, you have all these great stories. You should put them in a book, you know, and you're like, oh, OK, yeah, I, let's go do that. You know, and, you know, a lot of times people will will sit there and go, yeah, maybe someday or, you know, I right. don't know. I might do that. But they never follow through. I I'm one that when something drops in my lap, I go, oh, I'll, I'll follow through on that, you know. So I think that's, you know, a recurring theme throughout your career and what makes your life so interesting. Um, we're probably getting a little short on time, but I wanted to ask if you could share one more thing about Oswald, because there is so much confusion. We've talked about it before. You'll always hear people saying Walt lost Oswald. Uh, Walt got him back. Tell us the yeah. real story of where yeah. Oswald came from and how he yeah. ended up back at Disney. Yeah. Walt never owned Oswald. Okay. He did not own Oswald. He thought he did, but he never owned Oswald. His producer owned Oswald. And uh, Walt was essentially a contractor. He, he was a contract studio making the Oswald cartoons, right? Even though he developed Oswald, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and essentially did the first Oswald cartoons he did not own that IP. And as you know, he had a, 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 I think a difficult relationship with his producer, Charles Mintz. Uh, and, you know, he, he, Charles was, was not impressed with Walt. He wanted, uh, he wanted the cartoons done for a certain amount of money. Walt wanted more money. Uh, and it just came down to the fact that, uh, uh, Charles Mintz felt like he could do the Walt, uh, the Oswald cartoons without Walt and, uh, and essentially set up his own Oswald cartoon studio uh, and took the second contract uh, from Universal to do the second 26 without Walt. And so that was a that was a major life lesson for Walt. And he created, along with Ub Iwerks, Mickey Mouse. Right. And uh, and instead of, you know, bitching and complaining that he lost the character, he turned around and said, OK, fine. You know, I don't have that character. I'm going to create my own character and going forward, I'm going to own all of my IP uh, and uh, no one else is going to own it. It's all going to be mine, you know, and that's exactly what happened, uh, you know, and Mickey Mouse quickly eclipsed Oswald quickly eclipsed Oswald and uh, and I could spend an hour talking about just you know uh, how the design of Oswald changed so drastically from what it was to what it became that you know he, he started looking like the Nest Quick Bunny like uh, he started looking like a cartoon rabbit like a real bunny rabbit as opposed to the the uh, uh, the, the the little rubber hose Oswald that we loved, you know, and uh, whereas with Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse evolves through the 1930s from a ru rubber hose Mickey Mouse, but each iteration of Mickey Mouse, it still looks like Mickey Mouse, right. you know, he just becomes more, uh, you know, uh, more of an articulated uh, 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 character you know the the jointed arms as opposed to rubber hose arms and legs you know they're jointed now he becomes more dimensional and rounded until you get to that beautiful fred moore uh sorcerer's apprentice mickey uh that was done uh you know which to me is like the sweet spot of the mickey mouse design you know uh sean's asking what uh what were your thoughts on his appearance in the 2010 video game epic mickey well 
I was not a huge fan of Epic Mickey uh, for a number of reasons. Partially, uh, I didn't think that uh, the, some of the characters were on model and things like that. There were things that I thought they could have done better. Uh, so I, I wasn't a huge fan of that. Thanks for the question, Sean. Uh, it's uh, nice to hear from you. You know, um, I could definitely see us doing a whole show just on Oswald. But yeah. if we things up, you know, you and I have had a conversation, and I'd sort of like to take this opportunity to say, as we're building out our wonderful world of animation website, uh, our vision, as we've explained, is it's going to be more than just our retail site. It's art shows, it's interviews like this, it's blogs, it's podcasts. It's a resource where people can go to get these stories, to get this behind the scenes, to educate themselves. And um, what we'd like to announce tonight with your blessing is that uh, Dave has so graciously agreed to come upon with us and sort of be our creative director and historian and help us create this wealth uh, of information and uh, we're working on a uh, broadcast component with it as well, where he'll be recording um, his documented series for us. So we'd like to officially uh, welcome Dave aboard and um, thank him for his participation. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure, uh, uh, Neil. I, I'm looking forward to a lot of great things with you guys. And I, I know that it, we're just a touch past six o'clock, but oh, I, do wanna, I, I, I do want to ask if we want to run over a few minutes, if, if anybody absolutely. else has, has any questions. I know Sean was great about giving us a question. Does anybody else who's listening and watching this uh, have a question? Shoot it to us. You can... Uh, you can ask really anything you want. I'm an open book. I will, you know, I will give you a straightforward answer. Yeah, maybe it might be diplomatic, depending on what the question is. <laughs> but, but if anybody else has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, and I just saw my logo, or our logo, sh uh, sh uh, sh uh, jump up here. I do have the Skull Rock podcast. So I will let let uh, the viewers know that uh, we have a weekly podcast. My partner, Al John Go. Uh, is really terrific. Uh, he's the, I always say he's the brains behind the operation. Uh, he really is. Uh, he's a broadcast genius. Uh, but he and I do the show weekly, and we have a lot of guests on. Uh, what was it like filming Beauty with the great Angela Lansbury from Lance? Uh, well, I got to tell you, Lance, uh, I, I met Angela Lansbury only a few times, but actually after... Beauty and the Beast. Uh, so when they when when they record uh, voice talent like Angela Lansbury, it's usually the producer and the directors who are in the recording studio with the talent. Uh, and occasionally you'll have uh, an animator like Dave Proxima did the uh, Mrs. Potts character that Angela Lansbury um, uh, is voicing the char voicing that character. So the animator Dave was in, in that in some of those recording studios. But I have to tell you, my experience with Angela Lansbury came a few years later on Fantasia 2000 because she does one of the interstitials for Fantasia 2000, and she could not have been the nicest person that you could ever imagine. She was just again. I feel so fortunate meeting these incredible people. Like, you know, famous people like Roy Disney and Angela Lansbury and, and the list goes on. They're, they've all been so, so nice. Uh, it, it's amazing. So that's really pretty cool. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Erica, thank you for saying that the podcast is an excellent podcast. Pamela, uh, I'm so looking forward to your House of the Future book. You what produce a perfect beautiful question. Book. Oh, well, people. that's a that's a shameless plug, but thank you, Pamela. I uh, I will tell you, and I, I I haven't told this to anybody else, but uh, there's an index being done for the book right now, and it's going to the printer at the end of the month. Uh, so it's on track. It's being released in October. Uh, and I have to tell you, I, I don't know, I, I'm biased when it comes to these things, but I have to say I am so excited about the House of the Future book because it looks gorgeous. It, it really, really looks gorgeous. And I, I'm just so thrilled. I can't wait for it to go out into the world. And, uh, and also my Nightmare Before Christmas book that I wrote 
six years ago for the 25th anniversary is actually coming out this year for the 30th anniversary. So I'm excited about that one too. Um, let's see. Thank you. It's been delightful. What if, when was the last animation pitch you made? Uh, well, I, I would say that uh, a couple months ago I pitched a project. I can't go into detail or even talk about it, but um, I'm, I still have my finger in animation. And uh, I still enjoy it. And I, I, I still love the art form. And I, I love the history of it all. I, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what's so exciting. I, I, that's really all I can say about that. <laughs> Dave, were you going to uh, give a little tease of the House of the Future? Well, hold on a second. Uh, what was your favorite Parks project? Um, you know, it's interesting. I really, I, I worked on so many different projects and I really loved them a lot. I mean, I, I will tell you that uh, working on um, the World of Color, which was a big outdoor spectacular at the Disney California Adventure, I really enjoyed that a lot because Steve Davison was the show director on that and Sarah Wiseman was the show producer. And they were just such fabulous people to to be working with. I, I just so enjoyed working with that whole team of people. And, and you know, I, I, I was overseeing the, the animation portion of the show, but, you know, there was just so many engineers and uh, hydrologists and all these different people involved. It was just really amazing what goes in behind the scenes of these types of projects. And I, I have to tell you, um, you know, the outdoor spectaculars, I did, uh, like I said, World of Color, I did one for Paris Disney, uh, Paris Dreams, the outdoor spectacular there, which was, you know, we, we had, uh, we did a Quasimodo, uh, projection of Quasimodo climbing the castle in the middle of the park, uh, singing out there uh, in French. Uh, and that was, you know, it was just like so much fun. And then I, I, I worked on a, uh, a spectacular uh, at the Disney Seas Park in Tokyo, uh, which was also really cool because it wasn't just projections. There were dancers and performers on floats uh, in the lagoon. There was fireworks. It was just like so many moving parts and there's just literally hundreds and hundreds of people that are involved in doing those kinds of, of shows. And you get the most joy standing in a crowd of people watching it for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I literally, I remember when I was at the opening of world of color, I remember standing in the crowd and I was, I wasn't watching the show because I'd seen it a million times already at that point. I was looking around at the crowd and, and how they were reacting to stuff. And that was, that's just like the greatest, uh, you know, the greatest feeling is, is this, is that you were part of a team that did something that's bringing so much joy to so many people. And that, that was always a lot of fun, you know? Uh, let's see, I already have the Nightmare Christmas book ordered. Thank you, Erica, for doing that. Um, I'm, I'm excited about that book because it's a real behind the scenes of how that movie came to be. And I had the opportunity to interview a lot of the animators and a lot of the filmmakers. I interviewed Tim Burton and I spent a day with Henry Selleck, the director. Uh, and by the way, Tim and Henry, they first met at Cal Arts, you know, uh, and uh, Rick Heinrichs, uh, who is the, uh, um, uh, he was the production consultant, but really he was kind of the production designer. Um, you know, he's worked with Tim on a lot of Tim's film, another guy that went to Cal Arts. Um, uh, but uh, I spent time with Danny Elfman, just talking to him about each one of the songs and the, the process, the creative process. So you're really going to get this sort of behind the scenes of how that movie got made and, and the creative process. So I think that's an exciting book that's coming out uh, uh, in September. Boy, that was a burst of questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and, and, and listen, we'll, we'll stick around for we'll stick around for a couple more minutes if you want to uh, hammer us with a few more questions. I'm happy to answer them. The um, 
you know, while we're sitting here, Dave, we, we've concentrated so much on Disney, but you've done so much stuff outside of Disney, including one of my favorite shows, which sort of the antithesis of a lot of what you see around me, Ren and Stimpy. Yes, I I I have to tell you, you know, I I throughout my career I always did sort of freelance jobs, you know, and I I enjoyed working on commercials. And I'll tell you why, when you work on an animated feature, sometimes you're on that film for two or three years, right? Uh, you know, I was on Fantasia 2000 for like five years, right? So doing a commercial where I work a couple of weekends on the commercial and then it's done because right. commercial animated 30 second animation commercial has, <coughs> they used to have like an eight or 10 week schedule. Right. And so my part, like my special effects part would be like maybe a couple of weekends and I was done with it. And then, you know, a few weeks later I'd see it on TV, you know? And so there's a sense of, Art from as an artist, there's a sense of, of, of fulfillment and gratification that you finish something, you know, that you're not waiting two or three years for something to show up in the theaters. And so I really, uh, you know, enjoyed uh, doing those kinds of projects. And the Ren and Stimpy project really came out of left field because somebody who I had worked with at Disney uh, wound up going over as a producer uh, on the Ren and Stimpy show. And and halfway into the first season, they were they were in trouble uh, on uh, retakes and stuff coming from over the overseas studio because some of the special effects work wasn't being called out properly. Mm -hmm. And so this guy, Jim, called me up and he said, hey, you know, could you come over and maybe help me out with something? And I said, sure, absolutely. I was always I'm always happy to help friends out. And I went over and met with him after after hours and he told me what was going on. And I said, yeah, so here's what I can do. This is how we should approach it. Da, 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 da. And so I wound up straightening out the retake issue because uh, they had like 90 percent retakes. I brought it down to like, you know, less than two percent. And uh, and um, uh, and I wound up working on four and a half of the five seasons. <laughs> you know, because they just wanted me back every uh, every season to continue to do it. And, and I enjoyed working on it because I loved the characters and I loved the show. And, uh, you know, I'm still friends with Bob Camp uh, and and all of that. Uh, Sean has another question. Do you think Oswald will get his own series in the near future? I don't know. You know, I I would hope that they'll do something with Oswald. I know that there was one little uh, like new Oswald short that was done, but I wasn't really sure what the reason was that they did it. I I kind of commented to a friend. I thought maybe they did it just for copyright reasons. I don't know. It was sort of a rehash of some gags from some early Oswald cartoons. So I'm not really sure what the issue was or why they did that. But I'd love to see them do Oswald in the style of the, the new Mickey shorts that they have uh, that I really enjoy. I know some people don't particularly care for those, but I like them. Uh, I love the fact that Dave is a very upbeat guy, and I love his vibe. Well, Pam, thank you. Pam's a friend of mine on Facebook. Uh, I appreciate the comment, you know, and, and uh, I, I, I will, uh, we look forward to having you part of it. Yeah. But you know something, I, I, I do feel like I'm a very upbeat and I get it. I get excited about stuff and I, you know, because I love what I'm doing and I, I love, I love animation. I love writing books. I love uh, delving into topics that no one else has done, you know, dived into, you know, I have to tell you guys, I'm sitting at a 1939 Chem Weber desk, right? The studio gave me this desk because I was working on it for like 25 plus years out of my 32 year career at the studio. And when I was leaving, they asked me if I would like to have my desk. And I said, absolutely, I'll take this desk. And, uh, and it's funny because when I was working, I was writing the Nightmare Before Christmas book. This is like six or seven years ago. I'm writing the Nightmare Before Christmas book on this desk. And I sat back and I started looking at the desk like I'm doing right now. And I thought to myself, I wonder if anybody's ever written a book about the Chem Weber furniture. 
because he designed 22 pieces of animation furniture specifically for Walt Disney's new studio at the time, 1939, the new studio in Burbank, which is now the corporate headquarters. He designed those 22 pieces of furniture and nobody had written anything about it. There was, there was a book on Ken Weber as an architect and his entire career. And in that book, there was literally one paragraph about the furniture one paragraph and i thought to myself oh, i gotta i gotta look into this anyway i wound up blowing the rest of the afternoon i was supposed to be working on the nightmare before christmas but i spent the entire afternoon doing online research and i located chem weber's archives and i reached out to the archivist and then i made an appointment i had to drive you know uh uh I actually spent an uh, over, it was an overnight trip to, to go look at all the stuff he had done for Disney. And I wound up deciding, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do this book. And I say in the beginning of the book, in my acknowledgements, it's my love letter to the Ken Weber furniture, because this furniture, it has a soul to it. It really does. You can feel it, you know? And so I'm, I'm, Oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm so thrilled. And by the way, that book won six book awards. And I'm proud to say that uh, also an owner of a Ken Weber desk sitting out in my office. But more importantly, I was fortunate enough to work with Dave and uh, we printed this book for Dave. Yeah. And I'm proud that it won uh, multiple awards. And it really is a beautiful book. Um, it's gorgeous. The image in it uh, yeah. just came out fantastic. It, 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 it's a beautiful book. And, and, and it really is a love letter to this furniture that, that, you know, really generations of artists have worked on, you know, and, and, and again, nobody wrote anything about it. And so I like to dive into those sort of untold, unknown stories, you know, because honestly, how many books can they write on Pinocchio or how many books can they write on some of these, you know, Snow White and stuff like that? I mean, there's so much documentation on some of those films. It's fantastic, but I don't think you need to do any more, really, you know? And, uh, and be, because in the Disney universe, there's like thousands of stories that still haven't been told. House of the Future has some great stories in it that people are going to be very surprised about. You know, and by the way, I'm just going to show this to everybody. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a card. Uh, let's see. It's the house of the future. Look at that. Huh? Little pop up card. And uh, there'll be more about that uh, as we get clo closer to the release of this book. Well, as we wrap things up, um... I will, I will do the, the little pitch. You can find Dave's books on the website um, if anybody is interested in them. Some of them have been popping up along the way. And uh, all of the books that we have uh, uh, from Dave are all autographed by him. And the new ones as they come out will be as well. And we want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and especially thanking Dave for tonight. And again, welcome him on board. And we look forward to many other uh, great talks with him. Um, but let's answer those last quick questions. I, I was just going to say, Lisa, I'm excited that you're excited about getting my House of the Future book when it comes out. Uh, and it's on track. It's shipping in October. Uh, Sean, have you thought, he, Sean's asking, have you thought about doing a book on the journey that it took to get Roger Rabbit to the silver screen? I, you know, it's funny, Sean, I actually have had a number of conversations with Don Hahn over the last couple of years, uh, or over the years, I should say, about a Roger Rabbit book. And one of the issues that we've run up against is that there's a lot of different entities that have hooks into Roger Rabbit. So getting all those clearances. But you know what? You know who could clear that in about two seconds? Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg could just say, yeah, let's do a behind the scenes on the making of Roger Rabbit and have it all documented in a book, you know? So hopefully maybe Steven's watching this. I don't know. Or maybe somebody who knows Steven is watching this and can get word to him. But all we need is Steven to say, yes, let's get that book done because that's a book that should be done. By the way, a friend of mine up in Canada, Ross Anderson, has written a really 
really great book about uh, Roger Rabbit and the making of it. Interviewed a lot of people, including myself, who were involved in that film. And uh, Ross's book doesn't have any pictures in it. It's it's a it's a book of text, uh, but it's a fascinating book of text. And it's um, gosh, I'm, you're going to have to hold on a second here because I, I have to now. I want to I want to give him a proper shout out. Uh, Absolutely, because, because I can't remember the title off the top of my head. But it's going to come to me in about two seconds, thanks to all this wonderful digital technology. Uh, and it is called Pulling a Rabbit Out of a Hat, The Making of Roger Rabbit. Uh, and it's by Ross Anderson, who's a terrific guy, uh, really nice guy. In fact, he's working, I think he's working on a book about... Um, uh, uh, Oh, gosh. Um. <laughs> We've kept you up too late. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm having a brain fade. But anyway, uh, uh, Pulling a Rabbit Out of a Hat, The Making of Roger Rabbit. You can find it on, uh, you know, any of the online book retailers. Uh, you can get your bookstore to order it. Uh, but really comprehensive book on the making of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, somebody's saying he lives in Brockville. Is that Canada? Brockville, Canada? Uh, I'm imagining it probably is. Uh, but uh, listen, uh, there's so much that we could talk about. We could go on and on. I think we've run 20-something minutes over what we were going to do. But we'll be back. Right. We we'll will be back. back. And, and I yeah. want more people with more questions. But I want to thank Pam. And uh, yes, so Pam is saying yes. Uh, Brockville is in Ontario, Canada. That's where Ross Anderson lives. There you yeah, go. That's some right. education as well. There, there you go. I love right. our friends Again, up in Canada. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And Dave, and we look forward to the next time. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for, for being here. And uh, have a great evening. Uh, have a great holiday weekend. And uh, I look we'll forward to soon. seeing everybody soon. Bye-bye.